class. So uh, try to finish everything up and uh, push our way through and, and uh, hopefully make some, uh, some good application of this material uh, as, we, uh, as we finish up. So we're in uh, Joshua chapter 18. As we begin here, Joshua chapter 18, uh, we have the congregation assembled at Shiloh, and they set up the tabernacle of meeting there. Remember, the tabernacle of meeting was where uh, Moses would meet with the Lord uh, back when uh, uh, the Israelites were still uh, in the wilderness. And Joshua was there with uh, with uh, Moses during those times. And after they crossed the Jordan River, um, the uh, uh, Tabernacle of Meeting and the main uh, uh, the main camp for the people was there at Gilgal, uh, and here. It just mentions it kind of fairly quickly in this one verse, but they moved their uh, their main place from Gilgal to Shiloh, uh, and that's that will be the main camp uh, where the tabernacle is, where the ta um, tabernacle of meeting is, uh, until the time when uh, Solomon builds the temple uh, and things are moved to Jerusalem. So. Uh, we have that uh, that move happening here. Uh, first 10 verses of chapter 18. Um, we've got the remainder of the land that needs to be divided. Hey, we need to get this done. Uh, he sends some folks to survey the land to uh, uh, figure out where uh, the best dividing lines are. Uh, verses 11 through 28, we have the territory of, of Benjamin. Uh, that we have, and that finishes up uh, chapter 18. And, and these statements here are very similar to what we've seen with the others. Um, you know, they're talking about the cities that are in uh, in the territory, talking about the boundaries of the territory, which were important things to be written down. Um, and uh, for our purposes, not a whole lot of application we can make there, uh, just knowing that the Lord recorded these things. We get into chapter 19, uh, kind of interesting. Uh, Simeon is uh, given part of the land of Judah. Judah's land was more than they needed. Uh, so some of Judah was divided to give Simeon some land. Uh, then verses 10 through 16, we have Zebulun. Uh, starting at verse 17 through 20 through 23, Issachar. 24 through 31, we have Asher. 32 to 39, we have Naphtali. 40 through 48, uh, we have the area of Dan. Then uh, we get to Joshua's inheritance. Uh, and and his, his uh, personal land for his family. Uh, that's laid forth there. Uh, and then verse uh, 51 kind of gives a summary statement of the dividing uh, of the land for all the different tribes. So at this point, all of the tribes have their territory except for one. And that would be the tribe of Levi. We need to get them uh, settled where they need to go. And uh, we're going to do, uh, we have two different chapters here, um, 20 and 21. The uh, chapter 20 deals with uh, six of the Levite cities in particular. Uh, and these would be called the cities of refuge. Uh, and these were six of the, of the Levites cities, uh, but they were, for a particular purpose. And God laid that out in Numbers chapter 35, verses 6 through 34. And again in Deuteronomy 19, 
uh, first 13 verses there. Um, and what these cities were des designed for, uh, for men to get a fair trial. If there was a situation uh, where somebody was killed accidentally, um, you know, the oftentimes what would happen is if you killed somebody in my family, I would come after you and kill you, a, a revenge killing. Uh, and what the uh, cities of refuge were, were um, areas where um, the person who accidentally killed somebody could flee to and get a fair trial. Uh, you know, that they would plead, yes, indeed, this was an accidental case. Uh, so there were procedures they went through, uh, and they were actually given a trial in uh, whichever city they fled to. Uh, if they were found guilty of murder, then they would be executed. Uh, if they were found to be innocent, uh, then they could stay within the walls of that city of refuge until either they passed away or the current high priest passed away. Uh, once the high priest passed away, then everybody who had fled to the cities of refuge could go back home. And uh, if anybody were to kill them, they would be guilty of murder and, uh, uh, and they would be punished kind of a, an interesting unique aspect uh of the law that's laid forth there uh but these uh these cities of refuge had to be um had to be uh determined communicated to everybody so they knew where they would go uh should something like this occur so we have that uh laid forth for us in uh in chapter 20 fairly short chapter and, and as we look at the map um we can see they are fairly evenly divided uh among uh among the territory so that people could uh could flee to them then in chapter 21 we get to uh the cities of the levites and uh, getting that figured out. Numbers chapter 35, verses 1 through 8, uh, is where uh, God tells Moses, okay, this is how the Levites are going to be taken care of. And uh, they're going to live in the cities and have some of the land around these cities, but they're going to be spread throughout all the other, uh, all the other tribes. Um, and the way they're distributed, uh, the map that we have on the screen uh, gives us an, an understanding of that. Um, and Levi was always di always divided into three groups. Levi had three sons, Kohath, Gershon, and Merari. Uh, and their role within uh within the tribe was different based upon what family they were in. Um, those who were from Gershom, uh, they were, while the, the people were traveling through the land, they were the ones who were uh, to care for and to carry the curtains for the tabernacle. That was their specific job. Those from Merari, uh, they were, taking care of the structural framework of the tabernacle. And then those uh, who were of Kohath, they were dealing with the sacred objects. That would be, you know, the uh, uh, altar of burnt offering, uh, the laver, uh, that would be the table of showbread, that would be the Ark of the Covenant, that would be... Um, the uh, the altar of incense, 
um, and the golden lampstand. Those were the things that uh, the Kohathites were specifically uh, charged with. And then there was one particular family of the Kohathites, and that would have been Aaron's family, Moses' brother, and his family were the ones that were the priests. Um, and we mentioned that before, and I'll mention it again, that uh, every priest was a Levite, but every Levite could not be a priest. It was just from Aaron's family and, and his descendants. Um, so as they're, uh, they're settling in these cities of the Levites, you can see the different clans are designated here. The descendants of Aaron, these would be the priests, are here in the south, Benjamin, Judah, and Simeon. And remember, we just had Simeon taking part of Judah's territory there. Then the rest of the Kohathites were right here uh, in Manasseh, Ephraim, and Dan. And they were always, uh, you know, in the jobs that they had, the Kohathites were there with the most sacred things, and specifically the family of Aaron being the priests. Uh, we have um, Gilgal here, we have Shiloh about here, and we have uh, Jerusalem right here in the bottom of Benjamin uh, on the border of Judah. So that's where the tabernacle was. And these are, this is the clan that's closest to the sacred things. And that always seemed to be that distinction. The, the closest was the Kohathites and then Aaron's family closest of all. Uh, and that's how we see them laid out. Then we have those of Merari here in the, the light brown. And then those of Gershon that are here uh, in the northern area. So that's kind of how the cities uh, get laid out. So what are all these Levites doing that are spread among the people? Well, Numbers chapter 3, verse 7, they're given uh, the assignment to assist the priests in their work. Um, you know, the priests are the ones doing the sacrifices, taking care of those things. Uh, but there's other activities that need to be uh, taken care of for for the tabernacle and later for the temple. Uh, so we have uh, taking care of the treasury was done by Levites. Um, we had uh, later on when the temple's there, the, the temple musicians were Levites. Um, they're helping, uh, not doing the sacrifices, but getting the materials there for the priests to do the sacrifices. So they're helping and assisting in this process uh, as they've been commanded to. Uh, interestingly, prior to the, to the Levites in Numbers chapter 3, uh, the firstborn were consecrated to the Lord. Uh, Numbers 3 verse 12 said, I'm going to take the Levites instead uh, for my special purposes and my special people uh, to be the, the priests before him. And the main reason for them being separated among all the people uh, we get that from Deuteronomy 33, verse 10. They're assigned the task of teaching the people. And the only way you could teach in the days before we had Zoom was to be there with the people. So the Levites had to be scattered and given this job of, of teaching the people. And included with that teaching the people, uh, keeping up with the book of the law copying the book of the law. So a lot of times the scribes were part of the Levites uh, who were indeed caring for, uh, for the scriptures. So we have these Levites divided out. And as we look at the cities uh, that they were in, listed in chapter 21, there were 48 cities in total. And as you can see, they are scattered all around. One thing you may notice as we've looked at uh, these different maps is sometimes it looks like the territories are a little different in one map from the other. 
that's because a lot of times we don't know exactly where these were. These are somebody's best guess. Uh, and there's occasionally differences of opinion. But these 48 cities scattered around uh, amongst the people. And they not only had these cities, but they had uh, what the, the passage here in 21, uh, like for instance, in verse 2, the common lands. Uh, that would be open lands outside the walls of the city. Uh, pasture land for their livestock uh, that they would have a place to graze. Uh, cities in these days um, tent were uh, fortified. Remember, that's uh, when the Israelites were capturing. That's the way the cities were. And there was these were not big. Uh, these were basically fortresses where the people could go uh, in times of war. So there's you know, people don't have gardens. It's not like the cities of today. Uh, but if you would think of it as the downtown area with a you know big fortress around it. I remember like Jericho was uh, about eight acres in size. And that was one of the big cities. So these are not large areas at all. Uh, but places where people were very, uh, very compact together. So with that, uh, chapters 20 and 21, we have the Levites settled uh, among all their lands. Then we get um, there at the, uh, at the end of uh, chapter 21, that passage we talked about uh, a little bit back on Tuesday, that uh, the Lord gave them everything he promised to give them all came to pass so uh, uh that's the completion of uh the settling of the land as uh, as god had promised so when we get into chapter 22 uh remember that uh as the people crossed over the uh the tribes of uh reuben gad and the half tribe of manasseh that were on the other side of the Jordan, the Transjordanic tribes, uh, the, their men of war came across the Jordan and worked with the rest of the Israelites in conquering the land. Well, with the statement at the end of chapter 21, this part of the process is done, and they're released from their service. And, uh, you know, every time we've we've heard about these uh, two and a half tribes and their commitment to be there, it's always they were faithful. They carried it out. And here uh, in these verses, uh, beginning of chapter 22, indeed, they were faithful and did exactly what they were commanded to do. In uh in releasing them uh Joshua gives them and includes with them a reminder to remain faithful uh verse 5 but take careful heed to do the commandment of the law which Moses the servant of the Lord commanded you to love the Lord your God to walk in all his ways to keep his commandments to hold fast to him, to serve him with all your heart and with all your soul. So there's that specific message uh, from Joshua to these people as he's releasing them. Uh, they've been faithful, uh, done what they've been asked to do, and uh, he encourages them to, uh, to remain faithful and sends them on his way. Sends, sends them on their way. Then we get to verse 10. Joshua 22, verse 10. And when they came to the region of the Jordan, which is in the land of Canaan, the children of Reuben, the children of Gad, and the half-tribe of Manasseh built an altar there by the Jordan, a great, impressive altar. 
Now, remember that uh, God was very, very specific about sacrifices. Sacrifices could only take place on the altar of sacrifice, the altar of burnt offering that was within the tabernacle. That is the only place authorized. Uh, God would occasionally authorize a temporary sacrifice uh, one place by uh, by one of the prophets uh, and did that on occasion. But uh, the sacrifices only took place there in uh, the tabernacle. So we have these two and a half tribes that build this larger than life altar there on the banks of the Jordan. Verse number 11. Now the children of Israel heard someone say, Behold, the children of Reuben, the children of Agad, and the half-tribe of Manasseh have built an altar on the frontier of the land of Canaan in the region of the Jordan, on the children of Israel's side. Who was this? We don't know. But it's an anonymous talebearer who's spreading word about what these two and a half tribes have done. And apparently, in how this message was delivered, we see the very next verse, verse number 12. And when the children of Israel heard of it, the whole congregation of the children of Israel gathered together at Shiloh to go to war against them. So we have these people building this replica of the altar. Somebody sees it, starts murmuring and complaining, and next thing you know, the whole country is about to go to war. Let me ask you, do things like this happen today? Yeah. Within the church? Mm. Yeah, they do. We have people who are tail bearers. We have people who listen to tail bearers. And then we have people who are ready to go to war before they know the totality of uh, the situation. And, and this is uh, one of those passages within the book of Joshua that has tremendous, tremendous uh, application for us today. Because it does happen. Uh, it happened back then, and it happens uh, even now. So we have the people stirred up, uh, been stirred up by this talebearer, ready to go to war. So what do they do? Verses 13 through 15, uh, the children of Israel sent Phinehas, who was uh, the son of the high priest, and 10 elders to go meet with him. Now, uh, his dad, Eleazar, who was the high priest at this point, uh, was a very old man. Uh, and uh, very possibly was not able to uh, to make the trip. So we have these leaders uh, who go meet with the leaders of these two and a half tribes to have a conversation to let them know why the whole country is going to come kill them. Verses 16 through 18. Now, granted, all of this started just because somebody saw this giant replica of an altar. Verse 16. Thus says the whole congregation of the Lord. What treachery is this that you have committed against the God of Israel? 
to turn away this day from following the Lord in that you have built for yourselves an altar that you might rebel this day against the Lord? Is the iniquity of Peor not enough for us from which we are, we are not cleansed till this day, although there was a plague in the congregation of the Lord, but that you must turn away this day from following the Lord? And it shall be, if you rebel today against the Lord, that tomorrow he will be angry with the whole congregation of Israel. So this is a whole list of accusations. Somebody saw something, spread it around, the people overreacted, ready to go to war, now here they're making accusations against these three tribes. And their justification for it, well, we know you've sinned, obviously, and because of your sin, we're going to be punished. So we're going to kill you first so that God won't be angry with us. That's basically what they're saying here. What's the basis for this accusation? There is none. Jumping to conclusions. They're jumping to conclusions, absolutely. Uh, so what we have here uh, is just an unmitigated disaster. Uh, that's about to happen. There's no uh, no justification for this. But we just have these uh, baseless accusations uh, that are coming through here that need to be dealt with. Verse number 19, uh, people say, Nevertheless, if the land of your possession is unclean, if you all don't like that territory on the other side of the Jordan, then cross over to the land of the possession of the Lord, where the Lord's tabernacle stands, and take possession among us. But do not rebel against the Lord, nor rebel against us by building yourselves an altar besides the altar of the Lord our God. So uh, this is really probably the only <laughs> nice thing these people do. They say, hey, if, if this is because you don't like that land, come on over. We'll give you some land over here. Uh, that it's, uh, you know, we don't, we don't want to be the cause of this, and, and we're trying to offer a way out. Uh, but again, <laughs> offering a way out from their baseless accusations. Uh, and then... Uh, you know, they brought up um, uh, here in verse 20, the sin of Achan. He's the one who took the accursed things from the battle of Jericho. Uh, Baal of Peor, that was, um, remember when uh, when Balaam uh, tried to uh, curse the children of Israel four times and the Lord would not allow him to? And Balaam finally said, oh, well, here's how you do it. Get these uh, women of the land to commit adultery with uh, with the men. Uh, and that uh, that horrible debacle uh, and the fiery serpents that, uh, that killed many of the Israelites. And the problems that came because of that. They said, oh, yeah, we, we remember those lessons. Uh, and because of that, we're going to be very, uh, very tough on you. Verses 21 through 23, we see these two and a half tribes responding to these accusations. Uh, verse 22, the Lord God of, of gods, the Lord God of gods, he knows and let Israel itself know if it is in rebellion or if in treachery against the Lord, do not save us this day. If, verse 23, we have built for ourselves an altar to turn from following the Lord, or if to offer on it burnt offerings or grain offerings, or if to offer peace offerings on it, 
let the Lord himself require an account. But, verse 24 begins. So, so they're saying, hey, if your accusation is right, yeah, we deserve death. But, starting in verse 24, here's the truth of the matter. And, and realize what these two and a half tribes have already done. Their men came across, they fought for the other people, allowed them to take the territory. They had been faithful in their service. Joshua released them because of their faithfulness. Uh, you know, these, these people have been showing character. Verse 24, but in fact, here's the truth. We have done it for fear for a reason, saying in time to come, your descendants may speak to our descendants, saying, what have you to do with the Lord God of Israel? For the Lord has made the Jordan a border between you and us. You children of Reuben, children of Gad, you have no part in the Lord. So your descendants would make our descendants cease fearing the Lord, not allow them to cross the Jordan and go there and present their uh, their sacrifices. Therefore, verse 26, we said, let us now prepare to build ourselves an altar, not for burnt offering nor for sacrifice, but that it may be a witness between you and us and our generations after us that we may perform the service of the Lord before him with our burnt offerings, with our sacrifices, with our peace offerings, that your descendants may not say to our descendants in time to come, you have no part in the Lord. Therefore, we said that it will be when they say this to us or to our generations in time to come, that we may say, here's the replica of the altar of the Lord, which our fathers made, though not for burnt offerings nor for sacrifices, but it is a witness between you and us. Far be it from us that we should rebel against the Lord and turn from following the Lord this day to build an altar for burnt offerings, for grain offerings, for sacrifices, besides the altar of the Lord our God, which is before his tabernacle. So here's the truth of the matter. They weren't building this to perform sacrifices, but to remind everybody on both sides of the river that we are one nation. We are under one law. And that the people on the other side of the Jordan should be allowed to sacrifice uh, there at the tabernacle with all the other people. This is uh, something, rather than to divide the nation, we intended for this to bring the nation together. A good thing or a bad thing? We did this to promote unity, not just now, but in generations to come. Is that admirable? Absolutely. Yet the other tribes were ready to slaughter and go to war against their brethren. So as we seek to make application from what we see here, uh, we need to kind of break this down and, and, and look at all the different parts that we've seen. We see the anonymous person, who makes the accusation, the talebearer, spreading it among the people. And so as we seek to apply this, number one, do not be a talebearer. And we talked about this in class the other day. If you think your brother has sinned, you go to him, Matthew 18. You go to him first and have a conversation. And then if you need to bring another brother or two with you, and if he still won't hear the matter, then you go before the whole congregation. 
in reality, what often happens, especially when you follow that pattern, is when you start having that conversation, there is oftentimes misunderstanding, miscommunication. And things can be resolved very quickly. The more people you get involved, the harder it is to resolve a matter. Amen? When uh, people Jeffrey, start choosing sides. Yes, sir. I have a uh, sermon title for that one. If I may uh, present that one. Mm -hmm. Looking for the best in others. That is my title. Absolutely. And uh, I've, I've preached this passage before. Uh, and it, it helps people to understand uh, and deal with, with. So we've got the, the tail bearer. We don't, don't need to be that. Number two is the ones who listen to the tail bearer. And when somebody tells you something about another brother or sister, immediately the first reaction to that should be, when you talk to them about it, what did they say? Because, as Brother Isaac said, always assuming, assuming the best. And, you know, assuming the best in that brother uh, who allegedly did something wrong, assuming the best in the brother who's telling you about it. Oh, yes, you must have already talked to them about it. And if they haven't, shame on them. Uh, if they have talked to that person, okay, oh, you're wanting me to go with you to talk with them again, like Matthew 18 says, right? And following that, uh, so there's, you know, if nobody listens to a tail bearer, the fire that he brings with him goes out. There's no fuel. And, and we need to be fire extinguishers. Uh, because, I mean, here we see this could have been a horrible, tragic situation that was averted. Uh, but it didn't need to even come to this uh, from the very beginning. Verse number 30. Now, when Phineas the priest and the rulers of the congregation, the heads of the division of Israel who were with him, heard the words that the children of Reuben, the children of Gad, and the children of Manasseh spoke, it pleased them. Uh, so they accepted the response. Notice what Phineas says in verse 31. This day we perceive that the Lord is among us because you have not committed this treachery against the Lord. Now you have delivered the children of Israel out of the hand of the Lord. So we see Phineas' uh, response there. He called it treachery. Uh, which I kind of shake my head. They didn't commit treachery. The treachery was actually by the ten tribes. Uh, delivered out of the hand of the Lord, if those 10 tribes uh, went and slaughtered their brethren without cause, just because of a rumor, that's treachery. Uh, and the leaders here, uh, give them some credit for going and talking uh, to these two and a half tribes. 
but Phineas here, what he should have said, hey, this is a time we need to repent of what we were going to do. You all were not wrong, but in us coming to attack you, we were wrong. And uh, should have been a little bit more humble of a response. So verses 32 and verse 33, uh, the 10 tribes stand down. And uh, everybody goes back home without, uh, without a war. Verse 34, the last verse of the chapter tells us uh, that that altar, they gave it the name of witness. For it is a witness between us that the Lord is God. Again, this was uh, uh, not a bad thing they did, but something that they hoped to keep unity uh, among the people. So, uh, fantastic uh, chapter that we have here. A lot of application and uh, something really to, to keep us thinking. Chapter 23, we have uh, Joshua's farewell address to the people. Uh, he's going to be 110 years old when he dies, so he's probably around 100 years old uh, as this is going on. Uh, so he's an old man, but he's been a faithful leader of the people uh, throughout, the, throughout the time of his life. You know, he was 40 years uh, 40 years old when uh, he began his uh, his work there with Moses. So he's been at this for 70 years. Uh, a man who, who lived a, a faithful life. And as he's giving his farewell address to the people, uh, notice what he says, uh, verse number five. You know, he's he's led them. They've taken the major cities. They still have mop-up work to do. Verse 5, And the Lord your God will expel them from before you and drive them out of your sight. So you shall possess the land as the Lord your God promised you. So you still got mop-up work to do. And, uh, and that's something you need to get done. Uh, verse 6, Therefore be very courageous to keep and do all that is written in the book of the law of Moses, lest you, lest you turn aside from it to the right hand or the left, lest you go among these nations who remain among you. You shall not make mention of the name of their gods, nor cause anyone to swear by them. You shall not serve them, nor bow down to them. Uh, don't do it. And yet, what are the Israelites going to be caught up doing? And in Joshua's farewell address here, and we're going to see that uh, from now through the end of this book and into the book of Judges, uh, all the way through the Babylonian captivity, the Israelites had a problem with idolatry. They gave lip service. Oh yeah, we're we're going to obey God, but they didn't do it. They continually fell into that. It after the Babylonian captivity, it appears that that finally finally cured them of their idolatry. But that's like twelve hundred years. Uh, no, wait a second, I, my math's wrong there. About nine hundred years. Eight, nine hundred years of them uh, just playing around, not wholeheartedly serving the Lord, uh, but dabbling in idolatry. And do we see that today? Yes. Half-hearted commitment to the Lord? 
sadly we do. Uh, there's far too many uh, that are not faithful to him uh, in the church, but also want to be in the world. And, and as we get to these passages here, allow that lesson to come with you. Think about that half-hearted, uh, because that's one of the big applications we can get uh, from this section of Scripture. It's one of Satan's oldest tricks. Uh, you know, to get people half halfway there, halfway committed to God, uh, but keep some behind. And they won't make it. The story is told of the uh, the fellow uh, who went to be baptized. And uh, as he was being baptized, took his wallet out of his pocket and held it up above the water. He was committed totally except for his wallet. And far too often, people take that kind of approach uh, to Christianity. Committed except for. And uh, and that's no good at all. Brother Tiske? Yes. I would use another example. Um, uh, when I go to uh, your music practice as well, you know, you work through a piece, you work through a piece, you may be able to play it, but you know, a piece works like this. It has different sections. So mm -hmm. some sections you will play well, others not. You know, I always think uh, when I approach the music, um, when you're working on a piece that you're not, uh, you're not doing well with it, it's like digging, digging, you take a spade, you dig and you dig and you dig till you find the gold. So the application in Christianity would be the same. You keep on digging and knowing that the Lord is behind you and eventually you will get the crown of life. Absolutely. One of my instructors in school used to say, uh, going far enough in Christianity to find the fun. Uh, there is nobody on this earth more miserable than a half-hearted Christian. You know, if, if you're going to be in the world, be in the world. Uh, you know, if you're going to be lost for eternity, have fun now while you can. Don't go through life and, and make yourself miserable. Uh doing things you shouldn't do and feeling guilty for it. Uh, that's, that's the worst life of all. If you're going to serve God, serve him wholeheartedly uh, and don't dabble in Christianity. Swallow it whole. And in there uh, is the satisfaction, knowing that you're pleasing God knowing that you're going to heaven and there's benefits to uh, doing things God's way. Life on earth gets a whole lot easier. Verses 12 and 13, uh, Joshua warns the people, if indeed you do go back, cling to the remnant of these nations, these that remain among you, because they haven't finished the job and make marriages with them and go into them and they to you know for certain that the Lord your God will no longer drive out these nations from before you, but they shall be snares and traps to you and scourges on your sides and thorns in your eyes until you perish from this good land, which the Lord your God has given you. So very clear warning. If you do these things, God will deal with you. Verse 14, 
uh, behold, this day I'm going the way of the all the all, way of all the earth. That's a, a poetic way of saying I'm about to die. And you know in all your hearts and in all your souls that not one thing has failed of all the good things which the Lord your God spoke concerning you. All have come to pass for you. Not one word of them has failed. So uh, he's building upon that, uh, the Lord's faithfulness in fulfilling every one of his promises. Verses 15 and 16 just like the Lord was faithful in fulfilling the promises of blessings to you, he will also be faithful in taking it all away from you if you disobey. He lays it out very clearly here for them. Uh, if you follow after these idols, if you... Uh, embrace the activities of these people who you're supposed to drive out, uh, bad things are going to happen to you. You see, God's faithfulness and his justice go both ways. Uh, as they're entering the land, his justice demanding uh, that the sins of those people in the land be accounted for, uh, that same justice when the, if the Israelites don't obey him, if they do the same things, should they expect a different result? Absolutely not. Uh, God's justice and his mercy and his faithfulness, they go both ways. There comes a point when he's fed up and he's not going to put up with it anymore. And, and we see that continuing on, uh, not only here, uh, but if we go to the book of Revelation and, and we see uh, chapters 2 and 3, the letters to the seven congregations in Asia. Five of those congregations got pretty stern warnings. You need to repent of what you're doing or I'm going to deal with you. And makes always makes you wonder, what is the Lord thinking about us today in his church? Is he fed up because of half-hearted Christianity? Is he, uh, is his patience ready to come to an end? Or we as individuals and individual congregations... Are we striving to get back uh, to where he would have us to be? Striving to be his servants, faithful to him. So that's uh, Joshua's farewell address there in chapter 23. And then we get to 24. Uh, and here he's bringing the people uh, to Shechem. Uh, and the Picture may look familiar. This is uh, by Mount Ebal and Mount Gerizim. Uh, the acoustics there, you can one person can address the whole nation. And uh, he's going to give them an address. Uh, and he's going to uh, talk about some of the things he's talked about already. Uh, and this really does, as we look at the chronology of the Bible, it sets the stage for the time of the judges, the dark days of Israel, uh, the horrible time there. And what I'd like to do, there's uh, an account that we have in uh, Judges chapter 2 that I think chronologically fits right here. Um uh, Joshua doesn't write about it in his book. We have it in the book of Judges, but Joshua's a part of it. Uh, the first six verses of Judges chapter 2. If you want to turn over there, I think this is pretty significant. Uh, so we're not sure exactly, but I believe it comes between chapter 23 and chapter 24. 
It could very possibly between chapter 22 and chapter 23. Uh, but somewhere around this period of time uh, is where it would fit. So here, uh, the angel of the Lord came up from Gilgal to Bochim, uh, which Bochim is uh, kind of a, an abstract little town. Um, I believe it was close to Bethel. Uh, could have been on their way up to Shechem, which they're going to get to in chapter 24. Um, not exactly sure. Uh, but one thing that I can tell you is this passage is out of chronological order, uh, being in Judges chapter 2, because Joshua is still here. Um, but we have uh, the angel of the Lord that shows up. Uh, and this, you know, we looked at before, uh, angel of the Lord accepts worship. Uh, when Joshua bowed down, when Moses bowed down, uh, Exodus 3, Joshua there in uh, the end of chapter 5. Uh, so this is deity. Uh, and, and I would argue this is the pre-incarnate Christ who is there. Uh, and he says to them, I led you up from Egypt, brought you to the land which I swore to your fathers. And I said, I will never break my covenant with you. Uh, so this is absolutely uh, what he had done for them. Verse 2, and you shall make no covenant with the inhabitants of this land. You shall tear down their altars, but you have not obeyed my voice. Why have you done this? That's got to sting. Why have you not obeyed my voice? Could God say that to us today? Church, why have you not obeyed my voice? Where God has spoken, he demands our obedience. Uh, always has. You know, going back to the Garden of Eden. Do not eat this fruit. Do not even touch it. And when Eve and then Adam disobeyed, when God says it, he means it. Uh, and, and this is one of the most tragic passages we have here. The last time the angel of the Lord showed up, he had his sword drawn. He was ready to fight for the Israelites to do for them uh, exactly uh, what they needed. And we saw his blessing throughout the time that Joshua was leading the people. But here, but you all aren't doing what I've told you to do. Verse number three, therefore, I also said, I will not drive them out before you, but they shall be thorns in your side, and their God shall be a snare to you. Verse 3 here is a very significant verse. The Lord had been with Joshua, had been with the people. They're, you know, The only time they were defeated was the first battle of Ai because of Achan's sin. But after that, they routed the people. Uh, the Canaanites could not stand up because God was with them. But here he's saying, okay, because you haven't obeyed me, because you started to mingle with the people of the land, you're uh, uh, not torn down their altars, you not obeyed, obeyed me and just got rid of them completely, here's the result. They're going to be a snare to you. They're going to cause you trouble from that day all the way till today. Israel still deals with the consequences of this. 
verse number four. The people lifted up their voices and wept. That's a good, good thing to do, but it was half-hearted. When the day comes, when our sin has been exposed, weeping, is that a good thing? Yes. But that godly sorrow needs to bring forth repentance, 2 Corinthians 7, 9, and 10. If that sorrow doesn't bring about repentance, a change of mind that leads to a change of action, that sorrow is worthless. So they called the land Bohem, and they sacrificed there to the Lord. Bohem uh, in Hebrew and in Greek uh, means weepers. So we're here, we've had the conquest of the land and that success. And here the angel of the Lord says, I'm going to stop blessing you like that. You're not going to have the success you've had before because you disobeyed me. So we can go back to chapter 24. Going back to Shechem. So this is uh, another farewell address by Joshua to the people. getting, Trying to get from them a commitment. So all the leaders uh, are there. Uh, and verse 1, everybody who's anybody. And Joshua begins his address, verse 2. Thus says the Lord God of Israel, Your fathers, including Terah, the father of Abraham, and the father of Nahor, dwelt on the other side of the river in old times, and they served other gods. So Abraham came from a background of idolatry. That was his family. Uh, something that we don't... Uh, read about there in the Genesis account. Here, by inspiration, we find out where, what Abraham was coming from. And that makes his obedience uh, in following the Lord, taking him at his word and, and moving from his family, from his country, to this land that God had promised back in Genesis 12, makes it all that more impressive. Um, and then from verses 3 through 11, Joshua gives them a brief history of the nation. Uh, the people involved in the great things that God had done for the people, uh, including the conquest uh, and the successful part of the conquest that God had blessed them in. And he makes this uh, the statement. Uh, in verse 12, I sent the hornet before you, which drove them out from before you, also the two kings of the Amorites, but not with your sword or with your bow. So you were fighting, but I was there fighting as well. Uh, God was, was clearly behind it all. Whether through the hands of the Israelites or through the hailstorm, uh, you know, the, the miracle that happened at Jericho, it was God who did it all. The result, verse 13, I have given you a land for which you did not labor, cities which you did not plant, and you dwell in them, you eat of the vineyards and olive groves which you did not plant. So this was all given to you. You didn't earn this. This was a gift. Therefore, verse 14, fear the Lord, serve him in sincerity and truth, and put away the gods which your father served on the other side of the river and in Egypt. Serve the Lord. 
So in context here, he's saying, put away this idolatry that was in Abraham's family before he came to the promised land. Get rid of the idolatry from Egypt that some of you are bringing with you. Uh, you need to get rid of all of that. Get rid of the idolatry of this land. Um, remember back in Genesis 31, uh, when um, Jacob is leaving Laban's uh, household with Rachel and Leah and the children, and Rachel took Laban's household idols, uh, you know, he was one of Abraham's relatives. And we see that idolatry, and here Rachel's taking one of the idols with her, or uh, several idols. Uh, we don't have an exact count on that. So there was idolatry that was going on uh, in some way, even in Jacob's family. And in Egypt, uh, they continued to serve the idolatry. So Joshua says in verse 15, there's a great choice to be made. If it seems evil to you to serve the Lord, choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve, whether the gods which your father served that were on the other side of the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we'll serve the Lord. You need to make a choice. This half-heartedness is not acceptable. Yet that's what the people were continually doing. And it just absolutely amazes me they would give the lip service, but wouldn't do it. And do we see that happen today? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yes, Lord, I'm committed to you, but I've got something else going on this Sunday, so uh, I'll catch up with you next Sunday. I'll follow you, Lord. But I still enjoy these friends who, who get me into sinful activities. Choose you this day whom you're going to serve. That half-heartedness is not acceptable. Verses 16 through 18. The people give a good lip service. People answered and said, far be it from us that we should forsake the Lord to serve other gods. For the Lord our God is he who brought us and our fathers up out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage, who did those great signs in our sight, preserved us in all the way that we went and among all the people through whom we passed. And the Lord drove out from before us all the people, including the Amorites who dwelt in the land. We also will serve the Lord, for he is our God. They talk a good game. And Joshua comes back, verse 19, and says, You cannot serve the Lord, for he is a holy God. He is a jealous God. He will not forgive your transgressions nor your sins. If you forsake the Lord and serve foreign gods, then he will turn and do you harm and consume you after he has done you good. You got to change. You're, what you're doing right now is not acceptable. Their mouths are doing this, but their actions betray them. Verse 21, oh, but we will serve him. Joshua, verse 22, basically says, okay, then you've agreed to it. 
you agreed to forsake these idols, forsake uh, this uh, polytheism, and serve only God. Verse 23, now therefore, you said this, now put your words in action. Put away the foreign gods which are among you and incline your heart to the Lord God of Israel. You got to change your behavior. And that begins with the heart. That principle was around back then and it's still around today. That's the whole idea of repentance, is it not? A change in heart that leads to a change of action. I've decided not to sin anymore. Verse 24, okay, the people are going to give it lip service again. So verses 26 through 28, Joshua writes it down and uh, sets a stone as a reminder. Then we have the conclusion here. The end of uh, chapter 24, Joshua died and he was buried. And then we have this statement in verse 31. Israel served the Lord all the days of Joshua and all the days of the elders who outlived Joshua, who had known all the works which the Lord had done for Israel. We're going to see that again in the book of Judges here in just a moment. Uh, but there was some faithfulness there that we see. Verse 32 uh, Joseph's body, which the Israelites brought with him out of Egypt, uh, that was buried. Not sure if that's chronological or if this is, oh, well, we're talking about people dying and being buried. We're going to mention Joseph here. Back in Genesis 49, he commanded his sons, bring my body home from Egypt and uh, bury it in the field that I bought there in the land by where uh, Abraham uh, was buried, Isaac was buried, uh, and their wives. Uh, and they actually buried their father there as well. Um, so Joseph's body's brought back and buried. And then uh, verse 33, Eliezer, uh, who was the uh, high priest, he died as well. So we have really the end of that generation. Uh, Judges chapter one, uh, we have some uh, some victories in conquering the land, uh, but we have some uh, you know some of that mop work mop up work being done in the first twenty six verses, then verse twenty seven through the end that wasn't complete, and God stopped fighting for the people. Why? Because they weren't obedient to Him. Uh, the you know the first twenty six verses here, uh, as the people continued on after the death of Moses uh, of Joshua, we see them. Yes, indeed, what this mop up work we were given to do, it's working. Uh, Till they stopped obeying, and we have that uh, situation in the first uh, few verses of chapter two, uh, the weeping at uh, Bohim. And then we have this uh, statement that we have uh, that I mentioned there at the end of uh, Joshua's life that's repeated here in the book of Judges. Chapter 2, verse 10. When all that generation had been gathered to their fathers, another generation arose after them who did not know the Lord nor the work which he had done for Israel. Then the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord and served the Baals. They would be idols of the land. And they forsook the Lord God of their fathers who had brought them out of the land of Egypt. And they followed other gods from among the gods of the people who were all around them. And they bowed down to them and they provoked the Lord to anger. So here, just a generation later, we see the people caught up in idolatry. And throughout the book of Judges, 
that idolatry of the people, uh, we see this cycle continue where God's people forget him. They go into idolatry. God sends somebody to persecute the people. They cry out to the Lord. He sends them a judge who defeats their enemies. Things are good for a period of time. Then they forget the Lord. They go back into idolatry. And that cycle just continues over and over and over again. And it's this idolatry, idolatry problem because of the disobedience in the conquest uh, that really gets, uh, it, it is a snare to the people uh, for hundreds of years to come. So as we think back uh, on the conquest, what, uh, what, personal applications, uh, things that change your life, uh, what jumps out at you, uh, something that you learned from the class that you uh, you can bring with you, help you to be a better Christian? Obedience? Uh, the sister said something? Obedience. Okay. Isaac, obedience? What about obedience? To the Lord. Faith being faithful and obedient to the Lord. Doing everything that he commanded. That uh that obedience. Okay. The sister said uh, said something as well. Yes, I wanted to say uh what I've learned uh from the conquest is a uh, giants are there for our opportunities. When they went there to scout the land, they will they say to themselves, we were like grasshoppers before them. Why is God is actually told them that they have to possess the land? It's only two of them, Caleb and uh Joshua. Caleb and Joshua. Joshua that mm -hmm. brought uh, positive, uh, like a positive attitude, and they possess the land. They possess the, the land which God has actually given them. So sometimes giants are there for our opportunities. We mustn't be afraid. If God has said it, He's going to make it to uh, see us through. <laughs> excellent, excellent. Um, so from my, yes. So from my side, um, I picked up the, the importance of just being informed or making decisions coming from an informed position and not just impulsively decide to do something. Um, looking at the chapter we read today, we find that mm -hmm. uh, war nearly broke out simply because people didn't uh, respond from an informed position. They just decided to act without getting full details of what was actually happening. And if you also look at the very beginning, they didn't just get into uh, the promised land without being informed of what kind of place it is, who lives in that place, what's in that place. So I think it's very important that we consider all that before we make any decisions or any conclusions with regards to anything in our lives. Amen. Good thoughts. Good thoughts. Who else has something? Um, I would say if we obey God in his command, we will have su success because we, we've seen with the, the uh, battle of Jericho where they just followed the instruction given to them and uh, 
they could enter Jericho easily and you know uh, broke it down in pieces and had victory. So if we follow God's instruction, victory is Satan. Victory is is there for us. Mm. Thank you. Uh, excellent, praying, excellent point. Me, I'm praying that we must uh, learn to or trust God always. When God says it will happen, definitely it will happen. No matter how long it takes. Mm -hmm. Look at them. God told them that you will possess the land. At the end of the day, the Israelites really possessed the land. No matter how long it took them, they really had the land. So that's what I'm saying that you must learn always to trust God. And that can be a hard lesson to learn, can it? Mm -hmm. Much easier to learn when we're looking at them uh, harder in our own lives. Excellent, excellent point. Brother, uh, I think we, we do well to uh, always read the last chapter in Corinthians and make application in our lives. Because that is why Christ came to display his beautiful attributes and characteristics, being obedient to the Father. And he's the only way that we can we can learn from him and make application in our lives and we will definitely be successful. Absolutely. And, and as we're, we're talking about that obedience, uh, and, and I like the point that was made about obedience really does lead to our success uh, and God's blessing. You know, so oftentimes when uh, uh, we're having to... Uh, to make those difficult decisions, uh, there's fear that comes in. Oh, if if we decide this is is this going to have a negative consequence on the church? Uh, is this brother going to be upset? Is that sister going to be upset? The first question always needs to be, what does God say? And how are we going to obey him? You know, that the first question is, you know, hey, we're going to obey. We may be fearful of some of the consequences of that obedience. And that may affect the way we obey, but we're still going to obey. That we can't let the fear of consequences keep us from doing what it is that, that we've been told to do. Uh, excellent, excellent points. Uh, uh, you all are, are, are encouraging me quite a bit. Let me ask you this. If somebody were to say uh, that they think God was evil and wrong for telling the Israelites to destroy the men, women, and children of the land, how would you answer them? I would say, uh, Brother Tisky, that we are created. Uh, we are liable for our actions. Um, God, we didn't create robots, to put it that way. And so the decisions we make uh, either be in favor of God or not. And um, God knows. And um, well, as far as I'm concerned, um, as I rightfully explained to you the other night, you know, they look uh, at situations in, in, in different ways. Even that uh, they would accuse God of killing children. But as I said, children were spared. They were spared because uh, think today of uh, how parents rear their children without God. Now, I think God did them, the children a, a favor, not a favor, uh, he protected them in that regard because he didn't want them to be uh, uh, raised by uh, wicked parents. 
So I would in many ways try to explain to somebody that don't blame God. Think of yourself and how you conduct your life. So if it's contrary to God's will, that is because you want to do it. You don't want to obey God. That is what I would say. Does anyone else have uh, have anything to add to that? Or Yes, I would actually say the Amorites' uh, iniquity was right, was complete. That's why God actually allowed the Israelites to, to kill them. For the bonus, where is that passage that tells us their iniquity was complete? Genesis chapter 15. All right. Excellent thought. Anybody else? Uh, <laughs> uh, okay, let me put it this way. Uh, we know that the whole earth belongs to God. And uh, God can establish whoever he wants um, in a place that he would like that person to be. So by saying that the Amorites, like uh, what my brother just said, they were doing evil and that was not did not please God. So God had to drive these people away in order to establish other people. But even when the conquest, when uh, Israel took the land, we see later, because they did not obey, God also took them away from that promised land. Some of them went to Babylon and the others went to um, what is uh, to Syria? Syria, yeah. So that's that's the thought that I that I have on on that. Okay. Does anybody have anything else to add to that? I have learned. I have learned that we can be more. We can we can be more than conquerors. And we can overcome fear and failure by faith. That's what I learned from the conquest. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, so it, it kind of sounds shallow in my own head, but I'm going to say it anyway. Uh, in response to your, your question, um, like whether or not God was being wicked by allowing the Amorites to be uh, more like uh, ambushed, if I can call it that, by the Israelites. So uh, I usually work with uh, this whole setup where you, when you make a promise, you know, you have to make sure you fulfill your end of the bargain. So you find that uh, already the, the Israelites were promised this land by God and he was simply just fulfilling the promise. Nothing personal, just, just fulfilling the promise. It is no <laughs> so God is no respecter of persons. <laughs> Excellent, excellent thoughts. How about this? Even though God said he gave uh, the Israelites everything that he promised, and we saw that several times, uh, Joshua reminded the people, God gave you everything he promised. Why were some of the nations remaining in the land? Why, why were people left? Disobedience, that's all it is, disobedience.
Somebody want to explain, uh, expound on that a little bit? You know, when God told them to drive out the Amorites, I think it was for their own personal interests. They were like guiding their own personal interests. Because they were told to totally annihilate all the, the kings, the people in there, and even the livestock. But because of greed and their personal interests, that's when they kept some of the things. Yeah, they made it. How do they now, now they were allowed to keep some of the uh, some of the spoils of war, but what they did take, what they did take, was the idolatry. Uh, and uh, you know, Paul wrote to the Colossians. He said, uh, "For us today, covetousness is idolatry." And, and there is a connection even back then. Uh, between covetousness and idolatry. Why would somebody uh, get involved in idolatry? Why would the, the Israelites go back and forth? Because they thought, well, if we uh, worship this God of this local area, then our crops will be more prosperous. Then our, our flocks uh, will be more prosperous. They were they were getting involved in this. You know, you have these uh, Canaanite people who were telling, "Oh yeah, if you want crops to grow here, here's what you do." And uh, clearly, some of that was uh, their knowledge of the land, but some of it was also their idolatry. Uh, so they. Uh, develop these relationships with the people that God said, don't do that. And uh, got, uh, got involved with that too much. One more question for you. What did you learn during this class that you didn't know about the conquest before? Just one thing that you learned that you didn't know. A fact. Some. I learned about the memorial where they uh, put the, the like uh, the stones uh, in the uh, after they moved from yeah after crossing the Jordan they put the stone uh, as a memorial you know to see themselves this is where we pass and the the, the it was dry. So, yeah, that's something I, I don't know why I never read that, but it was in the Bible. <laughs> <laughs> All right, somebody have any something else? Tell Bill, I didn't know about this story. So I just said it today. I didn't know that someone stuck something in almost started the war because of the rumor. Mm -hmm. I didn't know that thing. So that's what I've learned. And and also what she said now we um I've learned that we have to be the fire distinguishers. Mm -hmm. We must yeah. put out the rumors. <laughs> okay, so another detail I didn't think I would ever find in this in this uh, book. Maybe it's because I, I, I just perused through earlier on not actually <laughs> reading uh the part where they moved around with uh, Joseph's bones. I found it quite quite strange, but it was strange. 
All right. Did anybody have anything else? Brother Teske, I would conclude uh, by saying um, when you look at the lip service of, of Israel, there's only one thing to keep in mind. Action speaks louder than words. Mm -hmm. You don't have to say anything. Your actions indicate that you are either for the Lord or not for the Lord. Yeah. Good point there. Does anyone have anything else to add? And also, the Shechem, here in Shechem, the way it's, it's, it's located uh, geographically between these two mountains. And uh, whenever like God wanted to address them, he was addressing them there in Shechem. So I'm like asking myself, what's so, so special about Shechem? And then I noticed that it was like, like their like their amphitheater because of the location of the of the mountain. So it was like their stadium where God could like talk to them. There. It, it came out to me very 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 important there. <laughs> no. it's a, I, I would love to go there sometime and, and, and actually see that uh, that area for myself. I would love to. <laughs> I would love to. Yeah, let's let's plan a trip. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> then I went to school that I'm not there. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Did uh, Brother Wycliffe leave the uh, the quizzes there with you all? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Fantastic. If you guys want to knock those out now, uh, we should should be able to finish that within fifteen minutes. And, and if those uh, any of those questions are a surprise to you. Shame, shame, shame. <laughs> I want to say I appreciate you all and uh, and have enjoyed this time together. And uh, Lord willing, look forward to doing it again. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's good to meet you. You're very welcome. Thank you. Brother the Mok, uh, your program on the GBN is always welcome. I I'm actually very, very interested in the, tell me quickly how long have you been with good news now? Uh it has been uh a little over four years now. Oh, okay. Uh, in fact I have the app, so uh, I always listen to these lectures and uh, lessons. It's actually uh, you know uh, inspiring to put it that way. Oh I appreciate that. Be in and uh, truth for the day and good news, all those wonderful apps. Uh, the other one is uh, Apologetics Press. These guys must go mm -hmm. to those apps, they will learn a lot. <laughs> yeah, that's some good material there. Definitely is. Anyway, my love to Brother Philip. I believe he's is he there already? Uh yeah, he was here earlier. And oh. uh Lord willing. I uh, just uh, give love and to Brother uh uh Diamond as well. From, from we'll, do. we'll do. Thank you, brother. God bless you and your family as well. Thank you very much. I appreciate that.
Uh, but the two school are still there. Hello.